Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Let's all stand together as we sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit. together is your spirit. You are the common denominator of all of us. We pray that we would be united by your spirit and that your presence would be known in this place, not only here, but in our homes and across this nation. We pray that you be honored, glorified, and praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. watching online. Good morning. So let's start by reading today's scripture. We need Psalm 9, 1 through 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell you of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Make sure to check your emails regularly for updates and announcements. If you're not receiving emails, please contact Contact us at ministryadmin at gbcmd.com. Uh, we do offer Bible study classes on Zoom conferencing on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. right now, right? Yeah, well, okay. 9 or 10. We'll, we'll, we'll send them out an email, right? Okay. <laughs> then Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can access, access them by via email link or on the church website. In addition, um, if you have prayer requests, you can forward them over to ministryadmin at gbcmd.com. In regards to offering, we do have an offering box up here, and also you can give up on the website. If you're follow, uh, you can follow, follow along with the message by downloading the YouVersion Bible app. Just click on the three lines um, on the bottom right hand corner, click on events, and look for Germantown Baptist Church. In addition, the lyrics will be on there for the worship music as well. Um, also, this Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, there's going to be men's breakfast. Uh, breakfast and sandwiches will be provided, and you just have to bring your own morning drink.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's all stand together as we sing. You are the one. 
raise our voices, we'll join with heaven's voices. Amen. Who you say? <laughs> Yeah. 
You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now understands. You stood before my failure and carried the cross on my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now. took our place, paid our sin debt. Your death brought us life. And Father, we thank you for this gift. We thank you that you have purchased us by your own blood. 
And Father, we pray for your presence in our life. That wherever we are, we can stand only because of your righteousness. And as we stand, may we be your voice. May we be your light. May we be the salt that you have placed here to preserve. And Father, we pray again that as we open your word this morning, that you would speak to us. You would reveal your truth to us. And just as this message is titled, may you show us your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, have your Bibles this morning, say amen. amen. All right, hope you have your Bible at home. If not, uh, you have your phone and you can have the Bible app on your phone and that has everything you need for uh, this morning's service. You can see all the scriptures already found for you. Uh, you can see all the overheads that we have uh, here at the church. Uh, all that is uh, available on uh, the YouVersion Bible app. So I titled this message, Show Me Your Glory, and that's simply in response to uh, Moses' request of God. Uh, Moses got to a point where he had seen God do great things. Uh, he was there to witness firsthand God's power over Egypt and also how God could preserve his people throughout the wilderness. And it came to a point where God says, I'm going to lead you. And Moses said, you know what? I know you've done great things for me. I know you've provided. I know you've been there. I know that you are God, but I have just one request. Just show me your glory. That seems like a simple request. Actually, has any of you ever asked God that he might show you his glory? Anybody? Nobody here? I'm in the wrong church. <laughs> We want to see the glory of God. But do you know that that is a death wish? Because in this flesh and blood, in this body that we have right now, we're not capable of standing before a holy and righteous God. And when Moses requested this, basically what Moses was saying is, I want to see your glory and I don't care what it costs. You see, that's a totally different request now. Because you and I would say, Lord, I want you to show me this thing, but I want to know the cost. And let me see if I'm willing to pay it. And a lot of us would say, you know what? I don't want to see your whole glory. I just want to see about this portion of it because that's all I want to afford. That's all I want to sacrifice. But let's look at this conversation that, that uh, Moses and God has. And it's found back in the end of Exodus chapter 33 going into Exodus chapter 34. We know that God is holy. No sin can enter his presence. Um, and in order for us to come into his presence, in order for us to draw near to God, we have to die. Now that, that is a, an absolute truth. But that truth actually jumps us into the reason why Jesus came in the first place. So that we could come into the presence of the living God. And Jesus makes that way. So look at Exodus 33 verse 18. Verse 18 says, And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And look at what he says right here. I will proclaim. I will proclaim. That's going to be a very important, especially when we jump in chapter, chapter 34. Because Moses wants to see the glory of God, but it's not something that Moses is really going to see. It's more what Moses is going to hear. The Lord says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 20 says, but he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me. No flesh shall, shall see me and live. 
Now, at this pay, uh, place in the conversation, if you were having this conversation with God, and he said, and you ask, show me your glory, and he says, okay, but you're going to die. Would you be willing to proceed with that conversation, or would you just say, no thanks, I'm good? But Moses doesn't drop it. Moses knows the cost, and he still says, I want to see your glory. So in order to come, to come into the presence of the living God, we become dead men. We become, we become dead flesh. This kind of echoes what Isaiah, uh, and, and remember Isaiah had a vision. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah was not in the presence of God, but only in vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And when Isaiah saw the glory of God, what did Isaiah say? Somebody help me out. Whoa, is, I'm in the wrong church. <laughs> Woe is me, for I am. Yeah, somebody said it. Most of the translations say, I am undone. The little translation, I'm finished. I'm a dead man. I'm destroyed. And so even in a, just a vision of God, Isaiah realized that he was not worthy to stand before a holy and righteous God that he was a dead man. Um, simply because we are sinners, no flesh can come before God. That flesh has to die because of that sinful nature within us. We even see in the Old Testament sacrifices that you look at the tabernacle, you look at the temple. Before you go into the holy place and before you venture into the most holy place, what's the first thing that you would come into in the temple court? You come to the altar. And what was placed upon the altar? An animal. That blood, the blood of that animal was poured out. And that blood atoned for your sin. So before you could ever come into the holy place, the most holy place, there had to be a sacrifice. Now, that tabernacle, that temple was a picture of what Jesus would do. Before you come to the presence of the living God, there had to be a sacrifice that would take away your sin once and for all, and that's what Jesus did. After the death or the, after the sacrifice of that animal in the Old Testament, this aroma of this burnt offering filled the air, and it wasn't until then that that aroma, that burnt offering was offered up, then the presence of God was manifest. It's as if the smell of that innocent animal and its flesh burning had to cover the stench of our own sin. That's kind of the imagery of it. And so we look at uh, the temple dedication of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. 1 Kings 8, verse 10. It says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord, this is what Moses is asking for, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. It is said that when Solomon dedicated that temple, that no one could even count how many animals were sacrificed. Uh, they couldn't keep track of how much blood was spilled. It means there's a whole lot of sin to cover, right? But that was made first, that offering, that sacrifice, the, the innocent blood was poured out first before the glory of God came. That's Old Testament picture, again, of what ultimately Jesus would provide for us once and for all. So this, this imagery that we have, I, I think in, in regards to what is seen in the temple, in Solomon's temple, if we truly want God's presence to overwhelm us, uh, just like it did with the priests. It says that God's presence, His glory was so strong that they couldn't even do their ministry functions. They had to give up their agenda, what they were doing, and, and, and just be overwhelmed by the presence of God. If we want that presence of God to overwhelm us today, then we need to change how we do things. First thing the church needs to start doing is stop practicing religion. 
We have to stop trying to make ourselves better ourselves. Can't do it. We have to stop looking at checking the box off. Oh, I did this, I did that, I showed up at church, I gave an offering, I gave a tithe, I read the Bible this week. We have to stop checking those boxes off and stop practicing religion and begin realizing relationship with God. That's the difference. We can't be willing to come to the presence of God unless we're willing to actually die to our sin. That's the New Testament picture of this Old Testament uh, reality. So we have to be willing to die to our sin, die to ourselves, and die to this world. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans 6, verse 11 says, So you too consider yourselves, now he's, he's writing to believers, consider yourselves dead to sin. How many of you know what it means to be dead to sin? Or is that just a nice Bible thought? Oh yeah, I'm dead to sin. You know what that means? It means that sin no longer has mastery over you. It no longer bosses you around. When it tells you to do something, you don't do it because you're dead to him. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to explain this even further. Verse 12 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign, have mastery in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any part of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. So I, I like this imagery because he says, when you offer yourselves as a sacrifice to God, you offer all of you, not parts of you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where you only offer parts of your life to God. God, I'm willing to give you my right arm and my right leg, but the rest is mine. It does what I want. There's no such thing as a partial sacrifice. You go back to the Old Testament, all the animals that were sacrificed, were they partially sacrificed? Are there, were there lambs and rams and sheep and bulls just kind of like two or three legs missing and hobbling around because they were partially sacrificed? No. When they were sacrificed, it was the whole. And that same idea is what Paul is saying. Offer all of you, your whole body, not just parts. And then he says, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as a weapon for righteousness. So you don't do what your old master wants you to do. You do what your new master wants you to do. Then he says, verse 14, for sin will not rule over you because you are not under law, but under grace. You're not under checking off the boxes and pursuing religion. You are in a relationship with the living God. You have become his temple, his tabernacle. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus says, it says to, uh, to them all, it says, if anyone comes to me, he must deny himself. You have to deny yourself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Again, we're talking about people who are already following Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, this is a daily thing that you must do. Take up your cross daily. Now in the ancient world, how many times did somebody take up a literal cross? Only one time. The Romans made sure that when you took up the cross one time, it was a one-time deal. But Jesus says you take up your cross every single day because every single day you need to die to yourself. And in dying to yourself, you submit to the will of the Father. And Jesus says this, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. He's talking about eternal life. If you're trying to save it yourself and you're trying to go through all these hoops yourself, if you're trying to base it on your own righteousness, then you're going to lose it. Then he says, but whoever loses his life, whoever doesn't look at this temporary life uh, because of me, well, then you actually save it. You will have eternal life. So in the past, 
maybe even now in our culture, if God does not come near, it's out of mercy that he doesn't. What would happen if God just manifested in the United States today? Is there enough righteousness in America that it would welcome God and we would be able to behold his glory today? No. The Bible warns us that our God is a consuming fire. And nothing short of holiness can stand in his presence. God wants us to draw near. In fact, the whole Bible is about this idea that God created us in unity and community with himself. We messed that up. And then God pursued a way to make it right again. And that is through his own son. So that the end result would be the same, that we would be with him. He will be our God, we will be his people. So what does the New Testament picture of death look like? Well, Hebrews chapter 6 kind of gives us a little picture of what New Testament principle of death would be, and that is repentance. Repentance, we're turning from our way, we're turning from our Our old self, we're turning from, that's what Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily. Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity, not laying down, and then he says, the foundation of repentance from dead works. The foundation of repentance from dead works. So when we repent, what we're doing is we're dying. We're dying to sin. That's the Old Testament picture of the altar and the sacrifice. And that's dead works. So apart from anything, uh, apart from God, anything that we do, things that we do in our own strength, our pursuits, they are dead works. And God says you have to turn from those things, repent from them, change your mind, your attitude about those pursuits that you once had, And change your mind, repent from that, and repent to him. See, a lot of times people don't complete that picture of repentance. We think repentance is just turning from one thing. And we say, well, repentance is just saying I'm sorry. And saying I won't do it again. That's not a biblical picture of repentance. Repentance is not only repenting from, but repenting to. You turn from your ways, you turn from your sin, and you repent to Christ and you follow him. I remember as a teenager watching the old black and white movie from the 60s and I guess it's become a cult classic now. Night of the Living Dead. Anybody ever seen that movie? Night of the Living Dead. I remember my mom said it was so scary to watch the movie Night of the Living Dead. As a teenager, I watched it and I thought it was like a comedy. <laughs> it was pretty bad. But the premise is there are these, I guess we would call them zombies today. There are these living dead. They were dead, but they were existing. They were living in some capacity. And they were chasing people who were living in order to make them among the living dead. And if you've ever seen the movie, you, you, you remember that the scenes where these living dead zombies were walking really slow. And they were chasing people. Chasing people who were running, but they still caught up to them. I don't know how that happens. Zombie movies have progressed lately because now the newer zombie movies, the zombies aren't you know, just walking very slowly. They're running. Yeah, the new, new zombies are fast. Old zombies, pretty slow. But anyway, there's this idea of the living dead. And, and, and I, think, I think our culture is full of people who are living dead. They're existing. They appear to have life. They move, but they move a little slowly. But in essence, they're really dead. They're spiritually dead. Listen to what Paul says. In Ephesians chapter 2. In fact, every single one of us, before we came to Christ, we were among the living dead. This is what Paul says, Ephesians 2 verse 1. And he says, and you 
were dead in your trespasses and sins. He, went, he didn't say that you were dying in your sins. He didn't say that you were spiritually dying. He said you were already dead. In which you previously walked according to the ways of this world. And that is, again, repentance. This is how you used to walk, but now you walk differently. Then he says, uh, according to the ruler who exercises authority over, over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. Every single person, the living dead. That's how all of us were. Verse 4 is a contrast to that. That's how we were, but God. Isn't it neat that God intervenes? God changes the script. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. And then he says, oh yeah, by the way, you are saved by grace. You are saved by grace. Not anything you did, not anything you deserved, everything that God did. John chapter 12, verse 31 says, Now is the judgment, now is the crisis. That's where we get our word crisis. Now is the crisis of this world. Now the ruler of this world, which is Satan, will be cast out. And then Jesus says, And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. And then he said, he, This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So he says, when I'm lifted up, when I, when I finish the work, when I become the sacrifice, the offering, and I've made atonement, and I've purchased your salvation, I'll draw all people to myself. This is what Moses wanted. Show me your glory. God said you can't unless you die. But now God made a way. Because Jesus died in our place. No, so Jesus says, when I do this, I will bring all people. I'll draw all people to myself. Repentance simply turns us away from our living dead status and makes us alive in Christ. And this is the crisis of the world. This is the judgment of the world is what John says. It's the decisive moment of history. In fact, when you look at world history, everything hinges on who Jesus is. It's not by coincidence that we have B.C. and A.D. all in relationship to who Jesus is and what he did. Because ultimately, everyone who lived before the cross and everyone who lived after the cross, well, everything hinges back and points back to the cross of Jesus. Every person who has ever lived will give an account to his cross. What did you do? How did you respond to the sacrifice that Jesus gave on our behalf? It is the crisis of the world. His death brings us salvation. His death justifies us and has taken our sins and nailed them to his cross so that there's no longer any, any condemnation for us because he paid the price. Amen? So when God sees us now, it's no longer our unrighteousness that he sees, but he sees the righteousness of his son, the atoning blood of Jesus. So Moses wanted to see God's glory, and God says, okay, here's how it's going to happen. Look at Exodus 33, verse 21. Exodus 33, verse 21. Now God just, just told Moses, no flesh can see me and live. But God says, here's what we're going to do. The Lord said to him, here is a place by me, and I love this, you shall stand on the rock. You'll stand on the rock. Now, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that 
wherever they went in the Exodus, says they all followed, uh, this rock followed them wherever they ventured, and says they all drank from the same spiritual rock, and then he says that rock was Christ. That rock of the Old Testament Exodus is a type of Christ. It pictured what Jesus would be. And so God says, here's a place by me. You will stand on the rock. And then he goes even further, verse 22. So it shall be while my glory passes by that not only will you stand on the rock, but he says that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. Isn't that a beautiful picture of how we are in Christ? We stand on the solid rock, but we are also in the solid rock. So he says, you'll stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and then I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. You can't see my glory the way you are. I have to put you on the rock and in the rock. And who's the rock? Well, it's Jesus. The only way that we can see the glory of God and behold His glory is when we're on the rock and in the rock. Without Jesus, you can't come into the presence of God. Verse 23 says, And then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. My face will not be seen. We don't want to lower God down to simply being a man like we are. What he's talking about is personifying and making this applicable to us so we don't, we'd understand it. He basically says, you can't see my full glory. What you can see is when my glory passes by, what glory remains. The back end, the tail of, of what we would count as uh, the trail of God. There's an old hymn called Rock of Ages. Jesus, as we see, is not just the rock of the Old Testament that followed them throughout the Exodus. He's also the rock of the New Testament. In fact, he's the rock of all ages, right? A young minister traveled through England's rugged Cheddar Grove area. When all of a sudden... A torrential storm broke out. Strong, wind, uh, strong winds and, and rain plummeted down. And so he sought shelter. And I have a picture right there uh, of this little gorge, this cleft in the rock that he found shelter. And he tucked himself in that little shelter until the storm passed by. His name, Augustus Toplady. And um, this event inspired him to write the hymn Rock of Ages. And the first line says, Rock of Ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And he equated that picture of being on the rock and in the rock and understanding exactly what this means. Jesus is the Rock of Ages. God says, I have a way for you to come in my presence. But you have to be in the rock. Apart from Christ, you can't. Moses could not see the complete glory of God. He was shown a glimpse of the passing glory of God. And again, what Moses saw was not really something visual as it was more audio. Remember what we said in chapter 33 that uh, the Lord will proclaim His name. Look what happens in Exodus 34, verse 6. Exodus 34, verse 6. It says, And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed. This is not something that Moses saw. It's what Moses heard. It's the Word. The Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now we looked at that a little 
uh, twisted from its original text. We think that when one generation sins or has iniquity, that God is going to keep on punishing third and fourth generation after that. That's not what it, it says in the original. In the original, it's basically saying, when one generation does this sin, God comes back and sees the second generation doing the exact same thing. And he sees this generation after generation after generation. He visits the iniquity of each generation. Verse 8, so Moses made haste after God proclaimed his name. It says, Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worship. Any of you know how to make haste? Anybody know the secret to making haste? If you don't know, there are, there are some YouTube videos that you can learn how to make haste. But Moses made haste, bowed his head, and worshiped God. Now, Moses' request was that he wanted to see the full glory of God. God knew that that was not possible without Moses dying. Do you realize that God would honor that request, at least beyond the lifetime of Moses? In Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17 verse 1, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Jesus was transfigured. A uh, better way to put it, he, his glory was revealed. And guess who was there also? Well, it says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Isn't it amazing that God honored Moses' request and finally... When Jesus comes, when Jesus is transfigured, Moses sees the glory of God. But what he sees is Jesus. So, if you want to see the glory of God, who do you look to? Well, Colossians 1.15 says, He, Jesus, is the image, he's the visible aspect of, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation in, in status and in place. And down in verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God should dwell. So if you want to see the glory of God, all you have to do is look at Jesus. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God reveals his glory. God shows his glory by his Son. And it's the Son that makes the way possible to the Father. Jesus even says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So just as God, back in Exodus, says, I need to put you on the rock and in the rock in order for you to see my passing glory, Jesus is the fulfillment of that rock. He is the way and the only way that we come into the presence of God. If Jesus had never come to this earth, would you ever have any hope of seeing the glory of God? No. It would be impossible. God's glory would forever be separated from us because of our sin. Only through Jesus is this made possible because he took, literally took our place. Our sin debt was placed upon his cross in fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin, 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The glory of God is only visible when you are in the rock. And that rock is Jesus. There will come a day when every eye will see him. There will come a day when he will come in glory. And that will be also in judgment. Revelation 1 verse 12. John had spent years with Jesus as his disciple. And over the last 50 or 60 years before this was written, John hadn't seen Jesus since the ascension. So now he's writing as 50 or 60 years later, just trying to remember what Jesus was like. And now we have the revelation of Jesus Christ that John sees his beloved master. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And listen to what John says, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. When Moses asked to see the glory of God, God says there's a price. There's a price. You have to die. In essence, your sin has to go. Your sin has to be dealt with. You can't be half-hearted. So when God said, in order to see me, Moses, you have to die, Moses still said, well, I'm all in still. I'm willing to pay that price. Does God honor half-heartedness? Is there anything as partial salvation? Partial holiness? A little bit of righteousness? No. You can't want to be saved as we started this message. You can't only want to be saved in parts of your life. You can't say, God, I, I want to be saved, but I only want these portions of my life given to you. I want to be a sacrifice, but I only want to be a partial sacrifice. When God saves you, He saves all of you. That's the only way. You're either all in or you're not. There's a story. Oh, you're going to turn to uh, Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. Psalm 9, verse 1. There's a story about Ivan the Great. Ivan the Great was called the Prince of Moscow. And he's the, he's the one who's credited with basically expanding Russia to its uh, greatest territory uh, boundaries. Uh, he united many of the clans and tribes together and made Russia uh, what it is today. Ivan was really busy with his conquering. And uh, his advisors basically says, you know, Ivan, you need to take some time off and find you a wife because you need someone to be an heir uh, for your throne. And Ivan basically said, you know, I'm just too busy with all this uh, battling and conquering and, and stuff. You go find me a wife. I'm sure you'll do a good job. And so they came back and they said, we found a perfect wife. She's the daughter of the king of Greece, the Byzantine Empire. And they said, she's perfect for her. her name's Sophia, which is wisdom in Greek. Perfect wife for you. A perfect alliance with the king of Greece, the Byzantine Empire. 
But there's one little hitch. In order for you to marry Sophia, you have to become Greek Orthodox. And Ivan's like, well, if she's that great, I'll become whatever. So the king of Greece sent tutors to teach the catechisms, the, the, the doctrines of the Greek Orthodox Church to Ivan, as well as 500 of his closest soldiers, his, his armed guard. And so time passed, and they learned all about Greek, Greek Orthodox, and then they went to uh, actually have the wedding ceremony. And they said, before you marry, you have to be baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church. And so Ivan, with 500 of his closest troops in their full military garb, went into the Mediterranean to be baptized by 501 uh, Greek Orthodox priests. But then they realized there's another problem. Because the Greek Orthodox basically said, you can't be a man of war and be baptized into the church. So there in the waters of the Mediterranean, they came up with a solution. There's a little bit of compromise. Basically said, you know what? When we baptize you and your soldiers, what you're going to do is you're going to be submerged, but we want you to take your sword from your side and hold it out of the water. And that part of you won't be baptized. And this became known as the unbaptized arm. Legitimate phrase in the ancient world. That story seems kind of crazy to us. But how many of us are the same way? Lord, I want... You to save me, but I want to reserve just part of myself. The militant part. The part that, that wants to do what it wants to do. There's no such thing as partial salvation. You're either all in or you're not. You're either saved or you're not. You either give him your whole heart or you don't. And so when we surrender, we surrender all. Now we sing that as a hymn of invitation, but it's an absolute truth. God doesn't take partial surrenders. It's total. Psalm 9.1 says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. God demands wholeness. He demands all of you. So the question arises for us as we close. God says, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. No flesh can see me and live. You have to die. The way that you die today is you die to sin, but you live for Christ. Christ. He doesn't just save part of you. He saves all of you. And if you want to know His glory, the key to coming to the presence of the living God is that you stand on the rock and that you stand in the rock. That is the only way that you can come into the presence of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You that you wanted us to draw near. Your whole desire is for us to know you and to have fellowship with you. To see you in your glory. But the only way that's possible is for our sin to be removed. That's why you hide us in the cleft of a rock. And that rock is Christ. Pray this morning that each one of us would know this full surrender this wholeness that you desire our whole heart. You desire a complete sacrifice. May we not hold, withhold anything from you. And may we surrender all to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.
rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wound inside each flow be a sin, a double cure. verse Augustus Toplady became terminally ill when he was like 38 years old on his deathbed at 38 and one of his last phrases is basically that everything is okay that Circumstances didn't matter, conditions didn't matter, but he basically said this as one of his last lines, that all of his prayers have suddenly been turned to praise. Isn't that a beautiful thought to have at the end of this life? That everything you've prayed for, God has answered. He's fulfilled. And every prayer that you once had now just turns to complete praise to Him. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when our eyes to worlds unknown can be of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Amen. May God bless you. I pray that his presence will be with us. I pray that our heart's desire is to see his glory. And the only way that happens is through his son. Brother Aubrey, would you mind closing us in prayer? Father and our God, we come before you to thank you for loving us so much. Father, we're thankful that you are God, that you have told us that we cannot come unto you except through Jesus the Christ. Father, we thank you that you have provided this grand and glorious salvation a way to come unto you to all mankind. Father, we know that Jesus is the rock of salvation. We know that when we come unto you that we surrender our lives totally to you. We come before you at the altar of sacrifice. Lord, as we come to the altar, we give up our lives and we surrender to you. Father, we're thankful that in the church we are baptized into Christ and that baptism shows forth our death, our burial, and then rising to new life in Christ. Father, we just come before you this morning as we worship you, as we think of how great you are. We stop to give you thanks and praise and honor because of who you are and what you've done for us. 
Lord, may this word go forth throughout America, throughout the face of the earth, so all people can know that you are God, and there is no, no way to come to you except through Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this day of worship. We thank you for the freedoms that we have to come before you and call upon you. So, Father, we pray your blessing upon the people here, upon your church throughout the earth. So we thank you and praise you together in Christ's name. Amen.